What is up, basketball fans? Welcome to the NBA Outlet. I'm your host, Nick Fay. With me, as always, Corey Waldron and two guests today, Nick Cuvalo and Tim Hanna. Fellas, how are we feeling? Oh, super good. Always excited to be back on the Outlet with you, Nick. Uh, for the fellow guests, can't wait to chat it up with you guys. Talk some NBA basketball. Yeah, I'm glad to be on. This is the uh, this is the first time I've been on this show. Um, I did did full access with Corey a couple times last season, uh, but I'm glad to be on. I just want to say, Nick, you said Nick and fellow guests. I want to let make it known that I'm the co-host, not the guest. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's always a you pleasure just been to a have guest you. Like uh, 200 episodes. <laughs> <laughs> really have treated like that time um but nick tim pleasure to have you guys on and of course um the other nick nick fay uh, another pod in the in the in the works Continue. let the record reflect that i meant no disrespect i meant no disrespect <laughs> it's too late for that a no. jerk, a jerk, a jerk. <laughs> All right, so we're talking Raptors today, continuing the NBA Outlet preview series, which you can find on iTunes, Block Talk Radio, OTGBasketball.com, Google Play, Dash Radio, and YouTube. Also, you want to grab a OTG t-shirt, head to Design Tree, slash Off the Glass, use discount code OTG5. But let's dive into the Raptors from last year. Raptors, 58 wins, NBA champs, beat the Warriors in six games. Obviously, you guys are ecstatic about that, both being Raptors fans. How would you describe last season in one emoji? Uh, I would give it the trophy emoji just because, you know, I'm shooting for the obvious here. I'm going to get that <laughs> one off the table and before the uh, my guest and other co-host uh, snatch that one up. So we're going to go with the, emo- the trophy emoji. Uh, I can't think of anything better off the top of my head. Yeah, I had the uh, I had the celebration emoji with the uh, the little party hat and the confetti in the background. Uh, also kind of fitting, but I thought that was a good one. I'll go with the ring. Uh, keep it in the same um, line of emojis, you know. They, they got they got the chip. Yeah, I was going with a ring in this one. Obviously, there's no other ones to go with other than a trophy or a ring, maybe just a smile emoji or the celebration like Tim went with. But what would you guys say was the biggest positive takeaway of last year, obviously, other than the chip? Other than the chip, like, I, I got to say it's Siakam's development into an absolute franchise cornerstone for the franchise moving forward. I think what that did for the Raptors' direction, you know, knowing – that Kawhi was a flight risk is just tremendous. It gives them really like a foothold moving forward, uh, somebody to build around. And, uh, you know, even his development is not not over. So just to even see what Siakam becomes down the line, super thrilling for Raptors fans, aside from the title. Yeah, I, I had something similar to that. Uh, the growth of Siakam and uh, Fred Van Vliet, I thought he kind of really commanded the second unit uh, when it was his turn to be out there running the floor. 17-5 uh, and five without Kawhi uh, kind of gives us a little bit of hope going into the next season, uh, knowing that we still took care of business without Kawhi on the floor. Yeah, um, Pascal Siakam, I think, is clear-cut the biggest positive takeaway from last season. Obviously, winning most improved, emerging as the number two guy. And obviously, now that we know Kawhi is gone, P- Pascal Siakam will be given the number one role on this team. Uh, yet to be determined what that looks like and how he develops into that role. But Siakam gave all the positive signs that this can be a cornerstone piece going forward. How surprised were you guys for the jump from Siakam? Like, that's a really big jump he made last year. He went from being, you know, a role player to being a possible two-way star and winning most improved. Oh, a real big jump. Like, I, for, I did not see that coming. You know, like, I thought... With Nick Nurse coming in and the expectations around the franchise being like basically, you know, championship or bust, you got one season, uh, you know, do do what you can. I didn't think Siakam would make the growth that like that he well, obviously, I don't think he'd demonstrate the growth that he did this year. Uh, as soon as Kawhi came in house and the, the Raptors really started beefing up their roster with the Gasol trade, Siakam's game just grew right alongside the rest of the roster. You know, he did really well. Uh, in his role for the Raptors, and I think he, he's going to be ready to take on more responsibility moving forward. I think it was surprising, but at this point, you just got to keep that rolling. Yeah, same same here. I thought um, I thought he did really well stepping up. Uh, I honestly didn't, like most people, didn't really expect him uh, to really shine like he did, uh, but it really gives us hope moving forward. So I'll just say it. I really didn't know who the hell Pascal Siakam was. <laughs> <laughs> I um, not that I don't, I mean, like he was just a role player for me on the Raptors. Wasn't a guy I had pinpointed. wasn't a guy I would have said, watch out for. And then all of a sudden we're in, you know, the, the middle of November, late November and Pascal Siakam is proving himself to be a cornerstone piece for this Raptors team. He was incredible. Um, and I definitely didn't see it coming. 
it's funny is because usually you hear in the summer, you know, this guy looks great. He's taking a major jump and you hear it a lot. But in Siakam's case, we heard that last year and it actually came to fruition. Like he really took that jump and all that hype that was in the offseason came true. But talking negative, what would be the biggest negative takeaway from last season? Obviously, this is pretty hard considering the Raptors won the championship. Yeah, we're nitpicking a little bit here uh, in terms of like execution. The team did exactly, you know, what they needed to do. But if we're nitpicking, I'm going to go with uh, the fact that OG and Anobi just did not see very many playoff minutes this year, um, like literally single digit minutes. And so that was disappointing for me as a Raptors fan. And Anobi is a part of the plan moving forward. Right. So we know this guy has a fair bit of trade value. He has a lot of uh, inherent value to the franchise. You know that the Raptors will ask more of him uh, as, as the future unrolls. Which means that, like, this playoff experience would have been really great for him. Uh, moving forward, if this Raptors core ever gets to go deep into the playoffs again, whether it be this season or the next, it'd be nice to have Ananobi with a little bit more playoff experience than he currently has. So him missing the playoffs was, to me, one of the biggest bummers of the season. Yeah, I gotta say, uh, similar to that, uh, but just kind of the amount, like, their rotation in the playoffs, kind of, like, the amount of guys that saw significant minutes... Um, I would have liked to see, you know, some of the some of the younger guys see more significant minutes. I think my, I mean, obviously we're nitpicking. Uh, biggest negative would have to be OJ in, in Anube as well. I mean, anytime you have a deep playoff run that ends up in a championship title, it's good to have that experience. OG had the experience from afar, not up close. Didn't get those games, those crunch time minutes, those big minutes in the playoffs. Um, and he's obviously going to be given a much bigger role this year with Kawhi gone. So I think that would be the biggest negative takeaway. But again, uh, we're nitpicking. There was a title that ended up in Toronto last year. Yeah, and it obviously worked. He didn't get those minutes, but I could see how long term you would kind of hope that he would see more minutes and develop more because his rookie season, there was a lot of hype around his name. But moving on to next year, talking about the Raptors uh, OTG power ranking, they're coming at number 13. What do you guys think about this? Fair, too high, too low? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to roll with fair. Um, 13 is, so you know, all the listeners know, top 16 <laughs> is all the playoff teams in the NBA, right? So 13 would rank them on the on the outskirts of that sort of playoff nucleus uh, of teams. And so and I think anywhere between the 10 and 16 range is, you know, yeah, those potential bubble teams, they could be a little bit better than they are, perhaps a little bit worse. I think Raptors at 13 with the composition of the team as it currently is, a weird mix of youth and uh, veteran experience up and down the roster, not a lot of direction. 13 seems fair. They've got a lot of talent on the roster still, but not necessarily a contender or even really a pretender. They're, they're quite outside the range of uh, teams that could make noise in the playoffs. Yeah, I 100% agree. 13, 13 is absolutely fair. The, uh, the shift of talent in the offseason uh, kind of contributes to this as well. Um, some of the teams that were ranked below the Raptors last season shot way up towards the top, um, but I, I think 13 is, is fair. Um, I think 13 is fair. 13 also, if I recall the rankings correctly, that puts them at sixth in the Eastern Conference. I think um, you're right. Yeah, behind only the Bucks, Sixers, Pacers, Celtics, and Nets. And I think going into the year, that seems about right. Um, if you're looking at the talent, obviously – the Pacers, Celtics, Nets, Raptors, and even the Heat to an extent. I think all those teams are going to be right around the mix for the middle of the Eastern Conference. Um, so 13 seems fair, and obviously it could dip if they decide to trade off some of these vets. and it, it could move up a couple spots if they keep this core intact and play through the year. Now, you know, you mentioned they could dip. What do you guys think would be the lowest they would drop if, let's say, they trade two out of three of their vets being Serge Ibaka, Gasol, and Kyle Lowry? If they were to trade, uh, I'm going to go with the more popular combo here. If they're going to get rid of Ibaka and Gasol, I could see them finishing as either the 8 or 9 seed in the East. They'd either just barely miss the playoffs, and that would probably, if there's injury time involved for either Kyle Lowry or Siakam, or uh, let's even say Powell or Ananobi, because at that point you'd be really talking about the cusp, the end of the season, coming really, like, really winding down, I'd say... I'd say probably they'd still make it just inside the East playoffs because I don't know if everybody's taken a look at the East recently, but it is not fantastic uh, in terms of star quality talent uh, outside of those like first six teams that we mentioned. So I think the Raptors could still, they'd be right on that playoff uh, playoff outskirt. Uh, yeah, I'd have to tend to agree. Probably somewhere between 15, 16, 17, something in there if they, had, if they would trade uh, any or all three of those vets. Uh, it just kind of depends on how well some of those other guys step up if they don't get a ton in return for those those vets. 
Um, I think if they tr- – this is – I'm going to kind of answer your question, but also kind of answer it my own way. I think if they keep Kyle Lowry and they move forward, they can make the playoffs still despite who else they trade away. If they trade away Kyle Lowry and one of the other two big vets that are expiring, I don't think they make the playoffs. Um, but I think Lowry is a big – will be a big factor on whether or not this team is fighting for like an eight spot with some guys traded away or whether or not they completely miss the playoffs. Yeah, I, just yeah, yeah, to, I, I can agree with on that. that. I want to touch on that really quick in that – my for when I when I talked about them trading away Serge and Gasol, if anybody's taking a look at the Raptors center depth or even forward depth beyond those two guys, I actually might want to amend my statement and say for sure if they get rid of uh, so not Lowry, but if they get rid of Ibaka and Gasol, I'll actually I'm gonna go ahead and say the Raptors will miss the playoffs 100 because they really have no front court bodies with any sort of like like I want to say solidified NBA talent ability to contribute minutes at a high level. You're looking at Chris Boucher. You're looking at the 59th overall pick, Juwan Hernandez, getting significant minutes in that scenario. Ibaka and Gasol, really, like, together, those guys make up all of the Raptors' quality center minutes. So if, if they get rid of everybody but Lowry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit my decision and say these guys are missing the playoffs. Yeah, I and, agree with you, Nick. I think missing on Gasol and Ibaka, just having two guys that are good front court players, especially Gasol from the basketball IQ point and where they where they brought the Raptors last year, and then you would just be putting so much pressure on Pascal Siakam to play power forward and really bang down low. And like you said, unless they're getting a center back, their starting center is looking really weak where Rondé Hollis Jefferson might be your best option. So I think there's definitely an issue if they were to trade both those guys. And I agree with the point, too, that Corey mentioned that if Lowry were to be traded – it would kind of just kind of signal to the team that, hey, we don't really care about the playoffs, and I think that has an impact, and they probably miss out. Yeah, for sure. Have to agree. Definitely. Definitely. Now, talking uh, off season, you know, Dewan Hernandez at the 59th pick, did you guys have any thoughts on him or, you know, second to last pick in the draft? You know, see how it goes. Yeah, he's almost Mr. Irrelevant. He's, he was one <laughs> away, very, very lucky. University of Miami guy uh, was injured throughout his college career, but the Raptors obviously saw something they liked. He's got uh, he's got good physical tools, six foot ten, two hundred and thirty pounds. Seems like he can bang down low, has some finesse to him. Uh, if he sees anything more than like seven, eight minutes a game this year, I'll be worried. Uh, that means the <laughs> Raptors have, have veered off into quite quite the reality. But that's uh, not much to say on the guy. How about you, Tim? What are you thinking? Yeah, he had. Uh, I was looking at the scouting report. He had decent numbers at the combine. Well, um, prove me wrong and make me remember your name. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Now That's talking uh, off-season free agent signings and trades and whatnot, we got Rondé Hollis Jefferson, Stanley Johnson, Cameron Payne, and Matt Thomas coming in. Thoughts on these guys, and which one are you the most excited about? Yeah, so basically Masai Ujiri walked into a community center in the uh, GTA area, Greater Toronto area, and saw some flyers on a bulletin board and just <laughs> took a whole bunch of them on some players that may or may not be NBA league worthy. So. These guys are all from 23 to 26 years old, so none of them are exactly super young, raw project guys. Uh, well, actually, they're all very raw in one end or another, but the, 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 point, the point being is that they're not super young. So Masai took a lot, of, uh, a lot of project guys on. Matt Thomas is a guy who shoots really well. Uh, he's kind of a one-dimensional player in that he doesn't really have great physical tools or great defense or reputable defense. Pat McCall, a little bit offensively challenged. Stanley Johnson, definitely offensively challenged. <laughs> and Rondé Hollis-Jefferson, probably the most promising of the bunch from uh, from the Raptors' offseason signings. Yeah, I have to I have to agree with that as well. Rondé Hollis-Jefferson, uh, he, was, he was okay last season, I think. Um, but yeah, I think he'll be, he'll be the, the best of the, the, the Brady bunch that they brought in this year. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously th- there wasn't a lot of room to work with, so they, they picked that, uh, they picked at some guys to see what they could get. Uh, Stanley Johnson, you'd like it from a defensive aspect. Will there ever be an offensive side to his game? It doesn't feel like it. Um, you know, he's had his chances around the league. Uh, now he's become sort of a journeyman the last year and a half or so. Uh, I think Ronnie Hollis Jefferson, there's definitely some potential there. I loved him in, Bro- loved him in Brooklyn. Um, a workhorse, a hustler, a guy who plays out of position, um, but plays with heart to fill in the position that he's playing. Uh, injuries have been somewhat of an issue. The fact that he can't shoot threes is an issue. But I think you like Ronnie Hollis Jefferson the most, especially if you end up trading away Kosar or Abaka. Ronnie Hollis Jefferson will probably have to play some bigger minutes. 
Yeah, you guys nailed it. I think Rondé's kind of proven the most in the NBA, so he's a guy that, hey, maybe he can work out. Nick was talking about the flyer. You maybe think about, like, sometimes you see a flyer and it says, like, call this number, and <laughs> Masai <laughs> posted, posted something that was like, want to play NBA basketball? Yeah. <laughs> and, and this is who called. No. Um, but <laughs> players out, we got Danny Green, Kawhi Leonard, Jeremy Lin, Jordan Lloyd, Jody Meeks, Eric Moreland. Obviously, you wish Kawhi was able to stay in Danny Green, but any of the other guys you wish they were able to retain? <laughs> not not really like it'd be i i'd like to for sentimental reasons like keep like let's say eric moreland around you know but or or meeks but it's it's just no and not not even close in terms of value like i don't even want to sit here and take your time up like no i'm gonna move on tim is there any any raptors old raptor there that you found, formed an emotional bond with uh yeah 2019 nba champion jeremy lynn uh, oh, that's right. <laughs> I know the the he's just he's getting old and his body's breaking down and I'm I'm glad he's getting his kind of last last shot in China. I think he's playing in Beijing or Shanghai. Um, but yeah, just for sentimental reasons, I, uh, Jeremy Lin. Um, I mean, uh, I think we all know the the easy answer. Um, <laughs> I mean. Yeah, I mean, I guess you miss Jeremy Lin from a from a nice standpoint. You're not gonna really miss anybody. I mean, there's it's the peace, love, and happiness. Everybody, we got an NBA championship that's still going to beat Toronto for the full year. Um, you know, I, I think you miss Kawhi. Simple, because you could maybe you have won a second one because uh, the team would have came back. Kawhi. No way. <laughs> I'm just gonna say. I mean, I'm not, I'm not. You know, yeah, aside from the obvious two, Danny Green and Kawhi Leonard. Like. I had to go with the obvious. Yeah. I think uh, you look at it this way, too, is like even some of the other guys at the end of the roster, like you maybe didn't get that much better of players, but there is potential for the guys you brought in to improve and maybe have a bigger role moving forward. All the guys they lost, you know, they know what to expect and what they're getting from those guys on a day in and day out. But talking next season, biggest team X factor, non-player and non-health. Yeah, so we're not talking about the injury bug and we're not talking about the development of any of the Raptors players. I think the biggest X factor is – the decision the front office makes regarding whether or not they keep the vets throughout the whole year. You know, do they let Ibaka and Gasol and Lowry's contracts expire and renegotiate something and just or just let them walk? Or do they get value for them midway through the season? I think that will dictate uh, really the course, the, the, the finale of this Raptors season. Yeah, I went with, uh, I went with age and contracts. Uh, after the season ends, assuming they keep Lowry, Gasol, and Ibaka, the team's only going to have six players on contract. And that includes Stanley Johnson's $3 million player option and OG's $3 million team option. So, I mean, if they if they want to, you know, make a make a playoff run this year, they're going to have to do something at the at the deadline or soon before uh, and then to kind of secure for next season too because, uh, like I said, there's only six guys definitely coming back after next season. Um, for me, I'm going to pivot on the Kyle Lowry front. Uh, the biggest X factor is whether or not they trade or keep Kyle Lowry. Because uh, I think it signifies the end of this Toronto Raptors run if they see Lowry uh, dealt out of Toronto. Whereas if you keep Kyle Lowry, you're at least making, I think, the somewhat guarantee that you want Kyle Lowry to be a Raptor for life. Because I don't think if Lowry makes it through the deadline, you're not going to let him walk for nothing in this offseason. Absolutely. Um, uh, would be my would be my feeling on it. Unless you do a sign trade, we obviously we see sign trades quite often nowadays. Um, but I think Lowry's the X factor on what direction this team takes. But again, uh, we all pretty much dance around the same thing. Yeah, we tell this guy it's not player specific, and he picks Kyle Lowry. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, Corey. Uh, I know. <laughs> I didn't want to say GM because literally what Nick said was the same thing I had, so I had to like, make some variation to it. Yeah, I mean, like, obviously, Lowry in the direction of the Vets is really going to determine what the outcome is for the entire season and the direction of the team because I think Nick's, Nick has referenced this in the past, you know, not a free agency destination. So losing those guys is obviously going to hurt. But I think also is father time and what type of value do these guys have around the trade deadline because they are still big numbers in terms of their contract and they'd have to take some bad money back probably to make a deal happen. Give oh, me, I have one uh, more action. Here we go. One right. more X factor. An actual X. Wait, we can't do. We need to coaches, right? Nick Nurse. Yep. I'll say Nick yeah. Nurse is an X That's factor a good one. because this will be the first year without Kawhi. Obviously, his first year being the man in Toronto. You want to chip. I mean, how much better does it get your first year as an NBA coach? You had Kawhi Leonard. What does life look like for Nick Nurse when he doesn't have Kawhi Leonard to rely on in certain games? Obviously, load management he didn't have him for the duration of the regular season. But still, how does Nick Nurse manage the lack of Kawhi and these young guys 
what does his system look like going moving forward? That's a really good one, too, because you have some of these pieces you brought in that are, you know, maybe on tap potential with Rondé and Stanley Johnson and Cameron Payne. Can Nick Nurse get more out of these guys than they have in the past? That would do a lot for him as a coach because obviously he won the chip. But if you're able to develop players, that's also huge. We know the success with Siakam last year. But getting to another question, give me a percentage for each guy being Marcus Gasol, Serge Ibaka, and Kyle Lowry in the percentage that they are traded this season. Okay, so I'll go Gasol 80%. Uh, there's a lot of teams that could use a lot of teams that'd be willing to give up something for a center who can bang down low for like 25 minutes a game, really high IQ passing, can run the offense, can run, step out, hit the three. Gasol just what what he brought to the Raptors last year in the playoffs. Yeah, like it really depends on how much you believe in his year over year like value depreciation. I think Gasol, fresh off of a FIBA tournament win, is still going to come in highly motivated. I think he's going to have a like a season good enough where the Raptors could actually get some capital from him. So I think he's going to he's probably the most likely of the three to me to get moved. Ibaka probably put at around sixty percent. Uh, that's just me waffling a little bit. I think it's more likely than not he gets traded again because of his relative age and uh, what he can provide another franchise maybe for a couple of seasons. Uh, he could be more than just a rental is what I'm saying. He could negotiate a new contract, kind of a back, back, backdoor agreement. And then Lowry, yeah, the lowest percentage. I give him a 25, 25% chance of being traded just because of how, means, how much he means to the franchise. Um, there's a lot of people, I see a lot of people, a lot of Raptors fans on Twitter saying like, don't give me sentimental value as a reason that uh, Kyle Lowry stays behind, you know, because we've seen some evidence that Masai Ujiri is not a sentimental guy necessarily, right? But there's there's a difference between making a, a move to win and making a move to, you know, appease the fan base or set up your franchise for future success, right? And so I don't think Masai will necessarily be as aggressive shopping Lowry as he was with DeRozan for Kawhi because there's just not as big of a payout. You know, it, it might be a lot easier and a lot better for the franchise to, to keep this, like, you know, possibly the greatest Raptor of all time happy for another couple of years. So I, I put his percentage at the lowest. I'm going to go with Gasol being 75. Uh, much like Nick said, he's still, he still has value. I mean, he, he kind of led Spain this year in the FIBA tournament. Um, so teams still, like they saw over the summer, still what he can do. Even after winning an NBA championship extended season, uh, he still had some left in the tank and went out and played really well for Spain. So I think he's got uh, the highest value uh, in terms of what they're going to get back for Toronto. Uh, Ibaka, probably, I'm going to go with 60, 55, 60, something like that. Um, not going to get as much back for him. Uh, and I believe his contract, yeah, his contract's uh, a little bit less money than Gasol. Uh, so I think Toronto wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily hate hanging on to that. Uh, and then Kyle Lowry, I mean, it, it'll probably it'll probably t piss a lot of fans off if you know he goes and then retires, you know, in two or three more seasons uh, and didn't just get to ride it out on a, a smaller contract with Toronto. I'd really like to see him, you know, kind of ride out the rest of his career. All of these guys are at, at least fifty percent. I would say Kyle Lowry is at eighty percent because I actually think Kyle Lowry is worth the most. Um, I agree. Having, a, having a point guard on the roster, having a veteran point guard on the roster, especially one who has NBA championship experience, I think is extremely important. The team like Orlando Magic sticks out in my mind. Even the Miami Heat, to a lesser extent, maybe if they get desperate and want to push for something. Um, so I think he has the most value. And then I would say Marcus Saul second with probably a 70% chance to get traded. Uh, obviously, I think Tim made a good point. I mean, last year, Marcus Saul has definitely shown his value, even in um, FIBA, he showed that value once again. And then Serge Ibaka, I would say 65%. Um, a little bit less, but again, uh, Serge Ibaka, you know, not the same defender he once was, but still a very good bench player. Yeah, and you really don't know what you're getting with Serge Ibaka. Like last year, he was good, but the year before that, he was inconsistent. So he's kind of all over the place. But I agree. I think Lowry would be the most intriguing for a team. I think he is definitely the big difference maker of the bunch. And he also provides some of those like winning mentality, just some of those hustle plays that you really need in a playoff series. But starting lineup on opening night next year. Yeah, so I don't think this one's going to be too different across uh, all of us. But I got uh, Lowry at point guard, Norman Powell at shooting guard, OG and Anobi at small forward, Pascal Siakam at power forward, and Marcus Gasol at center. Yep, same. I got the same, same thing. Same. I think this one's pretty easy. Now, if there was one change you could see, what would it be? 
uh, a single change, maybe maybe Ananobi hopping out for Rondé Hollis Jefferson if he gets some offense going, and an Ananobi's on a slow start. Corey, Tim, um, anything from you guys? No, not really. Um, I think there's a slight chance in a new they could play him way out, but I don't see it. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's let's pretty... like a two guard lineup even. Maybe Fred Van Lee could sneak in. I think that's a possibility, especially yeah, the instead way of Norman played. Powell. Yeah, Norman yeah. Powell could get booted for Van Vliet for sure. Because then you're that obviously yeah. the backup point guard role is kind of iffy then, so that's always a worry. But yeah, it would be it would probably be Cameron Payne. Oh God, yeah. God save us all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or you just have to perfectly stagger, you know, Lowry and Van Vliet's minutes. Split but their minutes, yeah. Who's the player to watch next season? So I've got Norman Powell. Uh, he's 26 years old, heading into his age 27 season. But I think this guy has uh, at least a mini leap present in him. So he's going to be getting starter minutes uh, throughout his career. He's had pretty pretty decent shooting splits, uh, especially last season. Very good, bordering on elite uh, for almost 40% from beyond the arc. And uh, very good free throw percentage, field goal percentage, just hovering around 50%. He, if he can just bring that on higher volume, that would be fantastic. That would already mean, uh, like... That would be a world of difference for this Raptors team. Uh, offense will be hard to come by, and I think Norman Powell could be the guy to provide it. So if, you, if he sees his points per game swell to around 12, 13, 14, 15 range, he'd probably be the Raptor who takes the biggest leap, uh, in my opinion, this year. Uh, I went with Fred Van Vliet. Uh, he's definitely going to get a significant amount of minutes. I'm thinking anywhere from 25 to 28 minutes a game. Um, just just because, you know, Lowry's getting older, he's getting less and less minutes over his career. Uh, and if his season gets cut short, uh, whether it's injury or trade or what have you, he's going to get thrown into that starting point guard role. And we're really going to need him to step up and kind of lead the – kind of well, not lead, command the, command the offense. So I like how no one's picking Siakam because I'm not going to pick Siakam. I think that's the easy player to watch. Uh, <laughs> but I'll go to OJ and Anube. Obviously, we mentioned him a decent amount in this pod. Him missing the postseason um, was unfortunate, but this is a guy who's going to be just 22 years old, uh, has averaged right around 20 minutes per game so far in his career, has shown some potential. Obviously, we saw the three-point shot dip last year to 33%, but it's, can he develop into a wing guy, a wing defender, three point three and D guy alongside Siakam and whatever uh, guard core the Raptors have going forward? Yeah, I think OG's the guy to really watch because there's so so much unknown with last season being injured and not seeing the minutes in the playoffs. Where is he at? How far has he progressed? How much work did he put in this offseason? But what's worst-case scenario for the Raptors team next season? Oh, yeah, the worst case is it would be rough for Raptors fans because we just want to chip, and the worst-case scenario involves missing the playoffs. So <laughs> you'd start slow. <laughs> uh the vets would just not coalesce. There's there would be obviously something missing from the encore product. You know, no takeover guy late in, later in the game. Uh, say Lowry's scoring doesn't return to what it used to be. Say Siakam doesn't really you know assume the scoring load or that doesn't come from other parts of the roster. The Raptors start off slow. Uh, they realize they're going to ship their vets off like well in advance of the trade deadline to you know to maximize return value. And uh, they'd miss the playoffs by by a distance, probably falling around the nine or ten seed, and they wouldn't even get a chance to, uh, you know, contest their championship title in the playoffs. That'd be their worst case scenario. Yeah, absolutely agree. Uh, missing the playoffs would be just devastating to a team that just won the championship. Uh, I think something else: starting slow um, and maybe a big injury to really anybody in that starting five, and then not having anybody step up to kind of fill that role, and then they just kind of start, you know, lose two or lose three consecutive um, over the course of, you know, a month, and then all of a sudden they find themselves 10th or 11th in the East come the All-Star break. Yeah, talking about teams that can't absorb an injury this year, the Raptors are up there. Raptors are definitely up there as a Absolutely. team that can that would not be able to deal well with that. Yeah, worst case scenario, I mean, there's two ways to go about this. Yes, missing the playoffs is the worst case scenario. Uh, I would argue that worst case scenario would be you keep all the vets to make an eighth seed, you lose in the first round, and then you lose all those vets for nothing. Um, but those are my worst case scenarios. Yeah, I think if you don't trade at least one of the guys to gather some type of asset, that's pretty negative, especially if you were to miss the playoffs. But even like Corey mentioned, if you get eighth or seventh seed and you're matched up with uh, Philly or uh, Milwaukee, who obviously are more talented than you without Kawhi, 
you know, that's just kind of a somewhat of a waste. But I mean, you could see the positive in some of the young guys developing. But ideally, you know, I think worst case scenario is not getting assets and not making the playoffs. But best case scenario. Okay, best case scenario. Uh, and again, we're talking from like the perspective of an average fan, you know, more so of a casual, because I agree. Uh, like to me, the best case scenario for this Raptor season would be, you know, take off all the expectations, trade all the vets and accumulate all the assets you can for another real championship run sometime soon. But uh, for, for the average fan, for the average Raptors viewer, uh, the best case scenario, I think, is a second round exit, uh, a six to seven game series with either the Brooklyn Nets, Boston Celtics, Pacers, possibly a matchup with uh, the Sixers or Bucks. Um, I think the, really the second round, the Eastern Conference semis is their, is their ceiling if they keep the vets. If they manage to avoid injury and there's still some growth across the roster, they could they could be a formidable playoff opponent. Uh, again, just missing that contender tier, so I think they could they could give somebody a hard time in the playoffs. But that's about as good as it gets. Yeah, I, th- I think Eastern uh, Eastern Conference semifinals is kind of the ceiling for this team. Uh, another thing, if they start off fast uh, and they look really good, let's say you know Abaka and Gasol have a really good first couple months, that might kind of put up a smoke screen and maybe some teams will give a little more than they thought because they're seeing how well these guys are doing um, and really not taking on a ton of dead money. Let's say they get rid of one of these big contracts, not taking on a ton of dead money. So they've got some room to work in the off season. Yeah. I think best case scenario would be um, the Raptors made it to the second round. Uh, they end up being, um, you know, a fourth seed in the East. They get home court. And they're able to make it, you know, some noise in the playoffs um, would be best case scenario. But again, that best case scenario is cloudy because I would still trade the vets to make the playoffs. Yeah, no, it's a great point. Obviously, you look at two perspectives. Top four seed getting to second round is one way to look at it. Another way would be if you could find a way without taking on a completely terrible contract and getting a first round pick or even just a young piece that you think could develop into maybe a fringe all-star would be huge for this team. And I think that's best case. But what's actual prediction in terms of where they'll finish in the division, playoff outcome, and who will be traded? Okay, so my actual prediction is that they finish third overall in the Atlantic division with a record of uh, 47 and 35. So uh, for reference, last year, the third seed in the division was at 49 wins. So this would put them right in that neighborhood. I'm not really confident if they finish as the third or fourth. Uh, I'm kind of expecting either one of Boston or the Nets to fall below them. I think the Atlantic will be a very hotly contested division this year. Uh, sorry, Knicks fans, if you're listening. Um, <laughs> but otherwise, yeah. Uh, and then in terms of the playoffs, I can see them being a first-round bounce um, without, without too much trouble, really. And in terms of who's going to get traded... I say it's. I, th- I think in my my heart of hearts, I think Gasol and Ibaka will be out of here, and I think uh, Lowry will get some sort of a, a couple of years, a little bit, perhaps maybe maybe a little bit higher paid. Uh, well, definitely not higher than thirty three million a year, but uh, maybe maybe a little bit overpaid for where he is in his career, just as like a, a thank you. I, I could see the the franchise doing that. Uh, I'm gonna go with anywhere. I haven't quite decided, but I think anywhere from forty five to fifty wins. Um, I think it. I think it's really going to depend on how they start. Um, in terms of where they're going to finish in the division, I had third or fourth, uh, just because you don't know how wet, how healthy. You know, the Sixers have always had problems with their health. The Nets, we don't know if KD is going to be back, when he'll be back, and the Celtics are a big, big mystery. Uh, in, in terms of who they're going to trade, I think I think I'm going to have to agree with Nick. Um, Keep Kyle Lowry, just give him, give him enough for you know a couple more years. Uh, but Gasol and Ibaka are going to be gone. I think Ibaka will go first. Like if Ibaka goes, it'll be before the trade deadline, and then I think Gasol will get moved at the trade line, similar to last year. Um, I have, sorry guys, uh, I have the Raptors finishing fourth in the Atlantic with 44 wins. Um, I'm expecting them to take a win-loss hit because they're going to be trading off some of these vets. Um, I do think they think into the playoffs. I want to believe they do Kyle Lowry right um, and they keep Kyle Lowry. I do believe the first guy off the board would be Marcus Gasol. Yeah, I'm pretty similar to Corey. I think I have about 45 wins. You know, obviously, if they trade more guys, it's going to go down. And they'll probably be knocked out in the first round, getting matched up with, you know, either Boston, Indiana, or Brooklyn, maybe even possibly Milwaukee or Philadelphia. And then I'm looking at, uh, it's tough to say, I uh, I think it might be easier for them to move Surge, and they might be more willing to just, like, 
get rid of him and take on like a second round pick, especially because Gasol's contract is a little bit bigger and they're not going to probably want to take on bad money because even not being able to attack, uh, attract free agents to Toronto, you still want to have that flexibility going through the offseason because that's when teams get really desperate, when they know that there's a big move in coming and they really need to clear cap space. So I think um, – they're gonna go with that, go that route. But uh, any other thoughts or predictions for the Raptors this season? Corey, you mentioned the uh, the Heat being a possible team that might might want Kyle Lowry. Any other teams you kind of think might want to take on that kind of money just for uh, half a season or poss- a possible uh, extension? The Orlando Magic, um, the Minnesota Timberwolves. Um, those would be the three teams that stick out. Um, yeah, I've, se- I've would, seen Timberwolves before. Yeah, I, I think those are the teams I would say stick out in, in my mind at this point in time. I'm sure Detroit would probably love to get in there if they could. Yeah, I, I, was on, I had Detroit on the, of my, on the tip of my tongue, but because of them signing Derrick Rose and having Reggie Jackson, like I just don't know, you know what assets they could send back to Toronto and which Toronto goes, yeah, I'm okay with this. I think Reggie Jackson's expiring, so it gives them. They have some expiring contracts where they could make it work if they really wanted to. But again, do they have the assets to kind of spice it up to get a Kyle Lowry? Yeah. But uh, anything, anything else, fellas? Negative. All right. No? League pass. Where do the Raptors rate one through ten? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna go with a five. Um... They're, they have no superstar. So if, if you enjoy watching uh, team basketball, like all those those old era Spurs, but even without even without their stars, you'll want to tune in to watch some Raptors games. I mean, there's going to be obviously some system play going on. Gasol, at least in the beginning of the year, will be making his trademark, you know, passes from the elbows, passes out of the high post. But uh, they don't have any late game closer. So this is, this is going to be a little bit difficult to watch for a lot of people. Siakam will bring some intrigue. But uh, otherwise, you're going you're gonna to have to be a fan of pass-happy uh, and lots of brickish basketball. That's something I'm going to give them a five. They're already split in the middle. Yeah, I gave them a five as well. They're going to be probably an average team to watch on League Pass. Like Nick said, there's not too many super, or really any superstars on this team. Uh, and I think a lot of teams are going to be tuning in to watch them just because they're going to be playing other big teams. Uh, they've, I think they've got 11 nationally televised games this year, and uh, everybody should be watching them on Christmas, by the way. We finally got a Christmas game. Hallelujah. <laughs> but <laughs> no, no, five. Five for me as well. Um, I'm giving them a four. Uh, I think you guys make good points. There's not an incredible intriguement to this Toronto Raptors season or team. Uh, I think if you're watching, you're interested in just seeing the development of Siakam and you're looking at some of those young guys and maybe you're scouting out to see if your team has any interest in Kyle Lowry, Serge Ibaka, or Marcus Gasol. Yeah, I'm going to go with probably a 4.5 here. Just even if the Raptors are good, they're not going to play an exciting style of basketball where it's like, oh, I need to tune in. If they're a good team, it's going to be because they play solid defense. But what TV show would you guys compare to the Raptors in terms of watchability or plot or both? Okay, so I'm going to go with the uh, the office after Michael Scott leaves. Uh, so similar to Kawhi Leonard. Uh, well, yeah, he, that's the analogy here that Michael Scott is Kawhi Leonard. Even though Kawhi Leonard was not around for nearly as long as Michael Scott was in that TV show, his departure, his presence uh, will sorely be missed. And so it really elevates the whole ceiling of the show slash like this team. You know, now that Steve Carell is gone, now that Kawhi Leonard is gone, uh, it really changes the makeup of what's happening, what they can what they can do. Uh, the Raptors are really going from one era to another, much like that TV show was at the same time. Yeah, I've got a show uh, similar to Nick. Um, and to bring up your point about Michael Scott being Kawhi Leonard, you could you could do Demar Derozan slash Kawhi Leonard. Uh, but I had two and a half. I had two and a half men uh, after Charlie Sheen's character leaves uh, and is replaced by Ashton Kutcher. Uh, I mean, similar to The Office, it was Charlie Sheen had been there for the first eight seasons, uh, and then gets. Killed off, shipped away, sent to rehab, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and uh, they bring in a new character. Um, so I didn't get any show that has a character leaving. I think you guys hit the nail on the head with those. Um, I went with – I know when we first did this, I had friends. Um, I'm going with the Big Bang Theory. Um, so the Big Bang is you got Kawhi, you got Marcus Saw, and you want a title. That's the Big Bang. Um, but otherwise, uh, the sh- – 
you know, the show's okay. There's some, you know, it's a solid show. It wins stuff. People pay attention to it. I don't really pay attention to it. I've watched some of it. Some <laughs> of it makes me laugh. Some of it doesn't really make me laugh. Um, and I think that's the Toronto Raptors more or less this season. Yeah, that's you guys had great picks. I went with How to Get Away with Murder. Obviously not a great show. The Raptors won't be a great team this year. But also after, you know, a couple seasons in, one of my favorite characters ends up dying. So now the show becomes less interesting, just like the Raptors without Kawhi. But, uh, guys, a pleasure. Thanks for taking the time to hop on. As always, you know, tell them where they can find your work and find you on Twitter. Yeah, so it was a pleasure being here. Uh, you can find me on Twitter uh, at Nick Cubs, N-I-I-K-C-U-V-S. Um, I'm writing stuff for OTG all the time. Uh, and just you can find me wherever. Chat me up. I'll debate you. I'll debate you furiously, especially when it comes to Raptors and stuff. So. You uh, you can find me on Twitter at Tim Sports Corner. Also find me on OTG. Uh, I'll I'm mainly focused on Raptor stuff, but I like to fill in for other teams uh, if we need it. Uh, and yeah, like Nick said, hit me up if you ever ever want to chat. Um, I like to debate movies and TV. Uh, so yeah, uh, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Kwal Hoops, K W A L Hoops. I co-host the NBA Outlet. Um, even though Nick sometimes forgets me, hops on as a guest. Um, <laughs> I also host Full Access Hoops. And Tim has mentioned the talk about movies and TV show. We are rebooting off the glass at the movies. Um, more of that coming. We're looking to pinpoint the Joker's coming out soon. So maybe that'll be a movie we recap, uh, but more to come. Yeah, obviously follow these guys. Great basketball minds. You can find their work on OTGBasketball.com. Uh, you can find OTG on Twitter at OTG Basketball. And obviously the podcast on iTunes, Blog Talk Radio, Google Play, Dash Radio, YouTube, and obviously OTG. Buy a t-shirt. Yeah. Peace down, Nicholas. <laughs>